Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you for joining us this morning at Hudson Institute. Um, I'm Seth Cropsey, a fellow here at Hudson and also director of Hudson Center for American Sea Power. I'm happy to uh, have the great pleasure to introduce our speaker this morning, Ephraim Inbar. Uh, Professor Inbar, uh, besides his service in the IDF as a paratrooper, uh, was educated at uh, Hebrew University and uh, at the University of Chicago, and uh, was visiting professor at Johns Hopkins University, Georgetown, and a uh, visiting scholar at the, at the Wilson Center uh, here in Washington. He is currently a professor of political studies at the Bar Ilan University in Israel and director of its very well-known Begin Sadat Center for Strategic Studies. The discussion this morning is uh, intended to look at developments in the Eastern Mediterranean, which are, uh, which I'll detail very, very briefly because I, you're not here to listen to me, but to Professor Inbar. What we're seeing is uh, a significant change in the Eastern Mediterranean, in the sea itself, as you say, the political and geographic influences in it and around it. Um, just to mention a couple of, more than a couple of points that are, uh, have I no doubt caught most people's attention here, which is why I suppose you've, you're, you're here this morning, but they're looking at the possibility of uh, a bad deal between the United States, the West, and Iran on the nuclear question. Um, the question, the issue of what effect that has already had and may have in the future on action that Israel or even the United States could conceivably take against Iran. Uh, I don't need to remind you that this organization that calls itself Islamic State is on the ramparts causing more than trouble. Uh, that the U.S. is supporting uh, Shia militias in Iraq at the same time that the United States is unwilling to go after Islamic State at its source in Syria, where ISIL's heart is, where its center of operations and center of gravity is. Um, the borders, in short, are, have already changed from what was established with the Sykes-Picot Agreement over 100 years ago. Uh, and if there's anybody here who thinks that they're not going to continue to change, please raise your hand now and we can discuss it later. Um, there's a, a uh, I believe that as a result of what's happening in with Islamic State, that the chances for a major terrorist attack in the United States uh, and or Western Europe and elsewhere in the world have gone up dramatically. I expect it will happen. Um, Turkey has, is returning to its Ottoman ambitions as quickly as 
its president can take it. Uh, many of you may have noted, I assume most of you have already seen by now, the footage of American sailors being attacked in Istanbul yesterday uh, by a Turkish mob. Um, I suppose you're also aware about the, of the Turkish warships that uh, entered the Cyprus's exclusive economic zones zone um, in the past few weeks. The Russians' presence in the eastern Mediterranean is increasing. I don't. I wouldn't relate it directly, but rather indirectly to the approach of tw 20 Russian warships to the Australian coast, which is taking place right now. Um, and all of this at the same time that U.S. naval presence in the region is small, far less than it has been in the past, and shows, at least for the foreseeable future under sequestration and this administration's budget cuts, no sign of increasing. Uh, the most positive thing I can say is that the developed and developing relationship between Cyprus and Greece and Israel and to a certain extent the United States in the Eastern Mediterranean offers at least the possibility, the suggestion, the idea that um, there is a conceivable replacement uh, to Turkey as the southeastern bulwark of NATO. Uh, but that is probably a discussion that would best be held by a longer, uh, a longer conference with a larger row of speakers. In any case, uh, here to comment on these and other issues that I've left out is Professor Inbar, and um, let me turn the mic over to you. You're free to sit here or speak yeah. for the podium, that's fine. I was thinking like, like no. good Jews. So. Whatever, whatever. <coughs> uh, good morning to everybody. Um, you came here to hear the bad news. Uh, I'll try to deliver. And uh, uh, I am s uh, speaking about a geopolitical unit uh, which is east of Medi Medi Meridian 20. It includes the uh, following countries, Greece, Turkey, Cyprus, Syria, Lebanon, Israel, Gaza, which is for all purposes an <coughs> independent political unit, uh, Egypt, Libya, this is a very diverse uh, region, uh, ethnically, religiously, politically. It has two clear choke points, you know, the Bosphorus, uh, which uh, can block, uh, you know, Russian uh, coming, the Russians coming down to the hot waters, warm waters, and of course the Suez Canal, which is uh, the gate of Europe to the Far East. Uh, historically, this is a meeting place between uh, East and West. Uh, if you read uh, Greek old history, the Persians and the Greeks, the Venetians and the Ottomans, you know, uh, maybe you read Shakespeare about uh, Othello, you know, poor Desdemona had to die in Cyprus, and uh, this was uh, part of the struggle between East and, and, and West. Uh, and I'll try to tell you what's happening here in this region, which Israel is a part of. Uh, and uh, to speculate or to analyze some of the implications of what's happening. First of all, as uh, it was rightly uh, <coughs> mentioned by uh, Seth Kropsey, uh, we see a clear uh, decline of American influence in the region, um, which uh, started uh, uh, as a result of the failures of, of course, Americans in Iraq and in Afghanistan, uh, but this was reinforced uh, during the times of uh, the current uh, administration uh, because of its uh, mishandling of uh, the uh, Arab Spring, what's called the Arab Spring, um, you know, helping ousting uh, an old ally like Mubarak, 
uh, leading behind. I really don't never knew what it really means. Uh, in, in Libya, and you know, Libya basically played uh, with uh, with the West. It uh, gave up its uh, nuclear weapons. It sold sold oil, and now it's a big mess. Uh, um, also, the lesson for everybody in the region is that uh, you shouldn't give up your nuclear weapons, because if you do, you are being invaded by the West. So I'm not sure this is a message we want to tell the Iranians. Uh, this administration engaged uh, the enemies of America, like Syria, Iran. You had many os oscillations versus Syria. Uh, the Islamic State, the recent phenomenon, uh, the administration didn't have a strategy. Afterwards, it has a strategy. Maybe now it has a strategy, but doesn't do nothing about what it's supposed to do in according to its strategy. Uh, the policy to Egypt uh, is incredible. Uh, the Americans, with their own hands, are pushing the Egyptians, which is the most important Arab country, uh, into the hands of the Russians, uh, because uh, you don't like uh, military dictators, that's fine, you know, but uh, maybe, you know, personal taste or this type of, are not that important in foreign policy. And uh, of course, the alternative, the Muslim Brotherhood is much, wo is m is much worse than, uh, than Assisi, uh, who is ready to, uh, to be an ally of the United States. Uh, US allies in the region are all bewildered by uh, the foreign policy of Obama administration. Uh, by the way, uh, I hear the same complaints uh, elsewhere. Uh, I travel uh, uh, too much in my wife's view. And, uh, you know, if I go to Delhi, uh, they hear the same complaints, Seoul, Tokyo, Warsaw. You know, it's all, all are uh, not very pleased what's happening, uh, you know, in your capital. Uh, maybe this can be explained by, uh, you know, the Americans are becoming more energy independent and maybe they need less uh, you know, the routes to the Gulf or the, the region. Uh, there are, you know, we are told that they are pivoting to China, uh, which is understandable because China is indeed a big challenge for the United States. It is a rising power that has to be dealt with. Uh, but again, uh, you know, uh, it's pivoting, but uh, in, in words and not, uh, not much in deeds. And in uh, Eastern Mediterranean, uh, the Sixth Fleet is much less felt and uh, uh, it causes uh, the Allies concern. Of course, uh, certain women in the Haifa port are also suffering, but uh, you know, that it goes with the territory. Um, and unfortunately, Europe, which uh, maybe could have uh, placed, uh, plays, play a role uh, in this region because it's very close, uh, countries like uh, you know, uh, France, uh, Italy, who have, uh, have a naval, certain amount of naval power, but uh, they are not there. Europe is not a strategic actor. They don't have the political will. They don't have the means. They don't have the strategic culture anymore to, to really to, to be a strategic player. So we see uh, some kind of uh, political vacuum. Uh, this has been uh, increased by the breakdown of uh, several, of two trilateral uh, alliances that uh, helped America uh, uh, manage the region. The first one is the uh, U.S., Turkey, Israel. Of course, the U.S. and two strong regional powers so that were allies. Uh, it was an important factor in stabilizing the, the region. Uh, since uh, uh, Erdogan uh, chose to distance, uh, distance itself, himself and Turkey from the West, then the relations with Israel soured. And uh, uh, this is the order of things. Basically, the Turks decided, uh, and I can give you many examples, not to be any longer a real ally of the West. And as a result of that, they, uh, as relations with Israel, also deteriorated. Um, and there is, of course, tension now between Israel and, and Turkey. And the US can no longer use this axis in order uh, to exert influence and power in the region. Another trilateral arrangement, uh, arrangement that went sour is, of course, uh, the U.S.-Egyptian-Israeli relationship, uh, which preceded uh, the end of the Cold War. Um, the already in 1979, uh, Kissinger was successful in, in the 70s in pushing uh, Egypt away from the Soviet Union, and uh, as a result of that, the 
Egyptians decided to sign a peace treaty with, uh, with Egypt, with Israel. Uh, and this changed, of course, much of the Arab-Israeli conflict dynamic, but also allowed the United States uh, to uh, bring together and to arrange cooperation, strategic cooperation between the Egyptians and Israelis uh, uh, in order to further uh, American interests. Uh, this has, uh, doesn't work anymore. Uh, you know, Mubarak was ousted. Afterwards, there uh, was a, a Muslim Brotherhood regime in, uh, uh, in, uh, in Egypt that uh, some Americans thought that this is okay. And uh, um, of course, uh, they, they didn't mind taking American money, the Muslim brothers, and, uh, but eventually uh, the military decided that this was not the route they, are <laughs> they wanted their country to go. And fortunately, Assisi established himself as a ruler of Egypt. Uh, but Assisi was greeted with uh, much skepticism and hostility in Washington. And as I mentioned before, he's being pushed into the hands of the Russians. They are talking about uh, arms uh, deals. Uh, uh, the Russians, of course, want, uh, and I'll say a few words about the Russians, want uh, a certain presence in, in Egypt to restore their presence. And actually what uh, we might see is the undoing of one of the greatest achievements of, of American foreign policy by Kissinger, bringing Egypt into, uh, into the Western uh, alliance. Uh, another uh, thing which we see in, the, in, uh, in our region is a growing uh, Islamist presence in the East Mediterranean, which is part of a larger phenomenon of uh, growing Islamist presence in, in the Middle East. And you have to understand that uh, the natives like Islamists. The natives like Islamists because the Islamists do deliver in contrast to their states. The Islamists are providing services to the people, education, social work services, medical services, while uh, the corrupt dictators uh, don't. And this is precisely the appeal of uh, the Islamists in our region, and we have to recognize it, because it's not something that is going to disappear uh, easily. <laughs> and uh, we have them, by the way, any election, free election you have in the region, the Islamists are going to to win or to uh, get a great amount of votes which will make sure that they are part, uh, uh, an important part of the emerging uh, political system. And uh, we see it uh, if we take a look at the shores of the East Mediterranean, of course in Libya, which uh, uh, you know, it's, it, to a great extent it's a failed state and there are but Islamist militias who play an important role in, uh, in, in whatever political system exists there. Uh, in Egypt, they were, you know, they, they won the elections and they were ousted, but still, don't minimize the great appeal Muslim Brotherhood has in Egypt. And they are important players and they can put millions of people into the streets. Um, unfortunately, the Egyptian state is not able to uh, enforce its sovereignty in Sinai. And we have uh, the Sinai Peninsula, uh, full of roaming Salafist, jihadist organizations who are uh, uh, killing Egyptian soldiers, are shooting once in a while to Israel, but are also uh, attacking boats on the Suez Canal. And recently, I just saw uh, yesterday, I believe, or the day before yesterday, they attacked an, an Egyptian uh, uh, military uh, vessel. Um, so, uh, and this is true of Gaza. Gaza is ruled by a terrorist, radical Islamist organization by, by the name of Hamas. Uh, if we go further along the coast, it's Israel, which is a Jewish democratic state, but north of it, it's Lebanon. And Lebanon is partly ruled by uh, Hezbollah, a radical Islamist organization, Shiite, an ally of Iran. And of course, the ports of, uh, of Lebanon are not ports that can be visited by uh, Western uh, ships uh, unless uh, they want trouble. Uh, further north is Syria. Uh, Syria is in the midst of a civil war. Uh, we don't know exactly what will happen in Syria, uh, but it's quite clear that at this time, we see Islamist groups participating in great force in the civil war, and uh, maybe uh, we'll see uh, if this war will end 
uh, anytime soon, I hope not, uh, that, uh, you know, Islamist forces are there. It's Nusra, it's, it's Islamic State, and, uh, you know, they have uh, many names. Uh, in Turkey, first the North, uh, I know that, uh, you know, Washington uh, doesn't like uh, to put it that way, but Erdogan is an Islamist. Islamist. Erdogan is a, a Turkish version of the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, it took him time to, uh, to display his true colors. Uh, but when he saw the weakness emanating from Washington, he understood that he doesn't take too many chances by uh, <coughs> being honest about himself and about the type of policies he wants Turkey to pursue. Basically, Turkey's foreign policy is uh <coughs> pushed, is fueled by uh, uh, neo-Ottoman and Islamist impulses. Uh, it's you know, uh, Turkey was never a perfect uh, democracy, democracy, but uh, now it's even less so. Uh, and uh, it is, uh, don't forget, Turkey has an imperial past and still has imperial ambitions. It is a, a revisionist power, not a status quo power. Uh, it rules also northern Cyprus. Uh, and under certain circumstances, it's quite possible that they'll take all of it. Uh, because uh, Cyprus has gas. Greece uh, is, uh, you know, the last country. It's not, it's far from Islamists, uh, despite uh, Albanian, you know, informal invasion of, uh, of Greece. You know, I think over a million, 10% of the population is already Albanian in, uh, in, uh, in Greece. Uh, but Greece uh, is uh, unfortunately in the midst of a, a economic uh, crisis. Uh, you know, there is so much you can count on the Germans, you know, how much more are they going to pay. And uh, so uh, they have to put the house in order maybe, but this obviously affects their ability to spend on, uh, on the military and as a result of that uh, to project power. Uh, but it is, uh, of course, a, a Western country uh, that uh, can be counted on. What are the implications? And I'll do it, you know, uh, try to do it telegraphically. First of all, uh, we see Russian encroachment, uh, which was also mentioned by, by uh, Seth Kropsey. Uh, the power vacuum uh, makes it easier for the Russians to return uh, to the area. Uh, in the 70s, of course, uh, it was the height of Russian influence, or Soviet Russian influence. Uh, they always uh, were successful in retaining their base in Tartus, in Syria, uh, which is important to them. And uh, they are supporting Assad. And of course, they are uh, indirectly, I don't know how indirectly, but maybe directly, they are an ally of Iran as well. Um, and they of obviously have, uh, under Putin, clear and anti-Western agenda. Uh, they improved, improved their uh, fleet size in, in the Mediterranean. There is much more presence uh, in, in, the, in, uh, in this part of, of the world. Uh, they have good relations with Cyprus. Um, and they uh, gained access to a Cypriot port. Uh, the Cypriots were ready to be bought by the Russians uh, because they're afraid of the Turks. Uh, but the Russians... Uh, you know, had some hesitation in, uh, in buying them off and, you know, providing them with a guarantee. Um, they have improved relations with Egypt, of course, the Russians, as I mentioned. Uh, there are reports of arms sales. Alexandria may become a, a port for the Russian Navy. Uh, Russia is, displays great interest in this region also because it is an energy producer and it has, it's very much interested in the gas findings, uh, recent gas findings in the Eastern Mediterranean. It has agreements with Syria and engages uh, even Israel, uh, as well as Cyprus, in uh, trying to help those countries uh, to uh, <coughs> exploit uh, those uh, uh, resources. Uh, we see also greater Turkish assertiveness. I mentioned it already. 
they are, uh, the Turks are investing a lot of money in modernizing their military forces. Um, and also their navy. Uh, apart from that, the Turks, in contrast to other uh, NATO members, are ready to fight. They are not Italians. They are not, uh, I hope there is no Italian in this uh, group that uh, will be offended. Uh, but uh, the Turks, uh, it's, it's a different military. And if needed, they'll fight. Particularly against Greeks. They have a, a favorite uh, you know, uh, enemy or rival. Um, they may fight in the Aegean Islands, in which there are you know, territorial disputes. Uh, they may get involved in, uh, in Syria. Um, and of course, they try to provoke Israel. Um, Turkey, in general, feels much less restrained in uh, <coughs> trying to attain the regional ambitions because uh, the perceived Western weakness. And uh, I think uh, uh, there is uh, much despise for a person that calls uh, Erdogan his best friend. Um, they also want to uh, be an energy corridor. Uh, this has been uh, an ambition that actually America and Israel helped them you know, with the Baku Jehan uh, pipeline, and they want to uh, have a hand on, uh, on, the, on the energy uh, that is in the East Mediterranean. It's close to home, and uh, they uh, will try to extend their influence via energy in Europe and in, in other places. Also, they want the money. Uh, There is an interesting relationship between Erdogan and Putin, uh, both very similar in their political outlook. And, uh, uh, but there is, of course, a history, uh, Ottoman-Russian rivalry, uh, which uh, will not disappear. And this uh, might come back. We see it already to some extent in, uh, in the Syrian arena. Both sides are on different <coughs> have different preferences. Uh, we see also the emergence of a, a new entente, Cyprus, Greece, and Israel, which have similar interests, blocking a revisionist Turkey. Uh, they uh, don't want the East Mediterranean to be an Islamic lake. They have clear uh, common energy interests, uh, the future of Cyprus, uh, as well as the Balkans. We don't want... Uh, uh, Turkish influence to be restored uh, to, uh, to Cyprus or to the Balkans. And they are active. The Turks are very active in the Balkans, which is a region which is uh, very close to, to what I define this Mediterranean. Um, Israel wants uh, the help of uh, Greece to be better integrated in NATO, um, more for political reasons than for military reasons. We really don't believe that NATO will fight uh, anywhere, but, but obviously not uh, on, on our side uh, if, if we need them. Uh, and I hope we'll never need them. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, the, the Greeks have two, voice, uh, two, <coughs> uh, two votes in the EU. It's Greece and, uh, and Cyprus. And uh, you know, we try maybe to attenuate some of the European, uh, you know, um, hostility to, to Israel, particularly on the Palestinian issue. Uh, and we see uh, intensification uh, at all levels, uh, which, uh, you know, uh, visits, high-level visits, military exercises, uh, uh, economic interactions, and this, uh, this trilateral uh, relationship, uh, a very multifaceted uh, relationship is, is, uh, is blooming. Uh, we'll see also in this region greater terrorism, for, for mainly for two reasons. As the state structures uh, are breaking down uh, around the Mediterranean, particularly in the Arab countries, the, the bad guys have greater freedom of action because the Muhabarat, the security services, are, are less effective in hunting them down. Um, Moreover, uh, the bad guys have greater access to, uh, to weapons. And we see, we've seen in Gaza weapons coming from Libya. 
um, sensitive equipment, and we see the Islamic State actually taking uh, over uh, much of the Iraqi, or a lot, uh, part of the Iraqi arsenal, which is American made, yes? So, uh, okay, so uh, they have good weapons. Uh, I don't know how well they are using them. So uh, we'll see greater terror. We'll see also piracy. You know? We may, uh, Sinai can become a Somalia easily. Uh, I think there is uh, great possibility that uh, uh, Al-Qaeda and Nusra will move to Cyprus, to northern Cyprus, and operate from there. Um, we'll see threats to the sea lines, be it from pirates or terrorists. Um, and this is part of the new environment. At stake in the East Mediterranean is, of course, also the Shiite corridor, you know, Iran, southern Iraq, Syria, and Lebanon, um, which uh, for Iran is very important. It uh, enables it, of course, to, to rule, to exert influence in, in, in the region in, of the corridor, but also to exert, you know, to try to project uh, uh, power in the Balkans. And they are active in the, you know, due to the great uh, American strategic acumen we have now in, uh, in the Balkans, three Muslim states. Um, the future of Syria is, uh, of course, very important in this context. And uh, um, if you ask me what should be done, I, uh, usually my answer is do nothing. It's uh, probably the best thing, but uh, definitely do not help Assad, because uh, Assad is uh, the linchpin in the Shiite corridor. And, uh, Everything should be done in order to weaken Iran, not to strengthen uh, Iran. We may see wars over the gas fields. Uh, Hamas has already been active in shooting missiles to Israeli uh, gas installations. Hezbollah threatened to do the same. Uh, therefore, the, uh, the good guys in the region should invest much more in uh, expanding their naval power, uh, defense budgets uh, are always, you know, criticized and it's difficult to justify. But uh, uh, Israel, at least, is uh, investing more in its uh, in its navy, and uh, this type of uh, activity should be emulated by others. Uh, another important uh, uh, mission is not to lose Egypt. And um, we should engage e Egypt. Uh, Egypt is, uh, again, the most important Arab country. It's the most populous one. And uh, as Egypt goes, much of the Arab world goes. And uh, we should not allow it to, l to move into a Russian sphere. The West, unfortunately, is not always aware of those developments. And uh, you know, uh, I'm not a great uh, fan of, uh, you know, uh, of Huntington, but uh, there is a civilizational, you know, aspect to, to this uh, struggle in the East Mediterranean. Uh, after the end of the Cold War, the borders of the West moved eastward. And uh, now, for the first time, we, we, we see that there is a possibility that uh, those borders between the East and the West uh, will move westward. Uh, I'm not sure that this is a, a good uh, development. Okay. Thank you. I'll take uh, questions now. Uh, we have time for questions. Can you hear me? Good. Um, would you please, uh, when you're recognized from the floor, uh, tell us your name and what organization, if any, you're represent or are affiliated with, sir? And we'll, we'll also bring a microphone so that... I thought my voice was loud enough. My name is Alan Mendelson. I'm a lawyer in private practice here in Washington. Um, I've become increasingly concerned about why the West doesn't do something about Kurd the Kurds. About? about the Kurds. Why doesn't the West begin to recognize a Kurdistan? We had a 1920 treaty, the Treaty of Sevres, that guaranteed a state to the Kurds. 
the Turks undermined their treaty, and for 40 years we had peace with Turkey, but now that we no longer have a peace with Turkey, and now that they're moving off, why don't we begin to look at the only group in the Middle East that can really be our ally and start moving towards an independent Kurdistan? I'd like your views on that. I think the main reason for the Kurds not having a state is that they couldn't put their act together. It's a fragmented a political community. Um, and um, if uh, they can unite the various factions, uh, obviously nowadays they have a good chance of establishing a state, particularly when they have an autonomous region in northern uh, Iraq. Um, I think that uh, a Kurdish state is a welcome development, you know, uh, giving some kind of more pluralism to the Middle East. But uh, I, uh, I'm not sure that the Kurds will be an ally of the West. Um, take a look at the map. I know that Americans do not, uh, you know, look at maps and, you know, <laughs> geographic education is, could be improved. Uh, it's a landlocked uh, entity bordering on Iran, bordering on Turkey, and uh, know, Iraq or whatever is there, you know, whatever it will be called, I don't know. Um, you know, with this type of situation, uh, they will, they have two choices. They'll have to maintain good relations either with Turkey or either with Iran. Uh, this means that uh, they have uh, to <coughs> listen uh, and do something in their foreign policy, in their future foreign policy, that will please one of those two countries. Unfortunately, none of those two countries is a Western ally. Uh, so I'm not, I'm not against a uh, Kurdish state, but I think that the hope that a Kurdish state will be a staunch uh, American ally uh, in the Middle East is not well founded. Uh, again, geopolitics. You know, it's not has nothing to do if at heart they are with us or not. I'm not sure. You know, where the heart is. You know, I, how sincere they are. You know, we there is no sincerometer around. You want uh, to yeah. run it, <coughs> Larry Moffat. Uh, Washington Times Foundation. Um, given the uh, the kind of the benevolent big brother role that Russia is playing in that region and the absence of the U.S. military presence, the U.S. Sixth Fleet, uh, the piece of paper we saw in the handout coming in alludes to shifting alliances. And I'm wondering to what extent Egypt, with its uh, desperate need for natural gas and its stated desires to purchase uh, Cypriot and Israeli gas, uh, to what extent they might be willing to play a role uh, in protecting it even militarily, which would of course pit them against uh, other allies, other former allies or allies. Uh, how, how, do, how is that equation likely to change? That's my question. Well, Egypt obviously is a very important actor. It has a, a large navy. It has an anti-Turkish historic attitude. They are rivals in the region for hegemony. And they would like to circumvent, to limit Turkish influence. It's quite clear, you know, the, the <laughs> type of exchanges between Erdogan and Sisi just are one indication about it. Uh, so, in my view, it is imperative to try to incorporate uh, Egypt uh, into the new um, security architecture. The greatest impediment to this is President Obama. So, uh, you know, that's, that's a fact. I, uh, so, uh, it is us, the Israelis, and I know, I know it. Our diplomats are spending time here in Washington instead of making sure that uh, we get support. That, they are uh, spending time uh, making sure that e Egypt gets, you know, a modicum of support from the United States. And we try to explain to everybody that is willing to listen that this type of policy, anti-Assisi policy, is a folly. 
But uh, I think it has changed recently a bit. But uh, this is uh, a clear Israeli interest, a, Greek, a clear Greek interest. I hope the Greek lobby is doing the same. Uh, and uh, Egypt should be part of it. And uh, should not be shied away by the Americans. Uh, thank you, Dave Rabinowitz. Uh, I was wondering what you think about whether the recent war in Gaza had any real impact on the situation in the area, or was it just an isolated incident? You know, the discussion between Kissinger and Chu and Lai, you know, about the French Revolution, you know. I don't know. It's too early to say. You know. uh, um, the... There is one valid interpretation that the Islamists can uh, get encouraged from, and this is that uh, Hamas, who stood for 50 days against strong uh, Israeli army. Uh, this is not good. This is not good for deterrence. This is not good for uh, you know uh, <coughs> to try to weaken the, the Islamists. Um, at the same time, Israel, you know, uh, if you do a military political analysis, won this war quite clearly because it debilitated uh, most of, you know, they remained with 20% of their missiles. And uh, eventually they um, accepted the Egyptian ceasefire, which they rejected for so many. <laughs> In parentheses, this Egyptian ceasefire was not an American idea, you know. The Americans were pushing a Qatari-Turkish ceasefire, which was uh, plain stupid. Uh, just take a look at the map again, you know. Who is calling the shots in the Gaza situation? There are two countries bordering it. One is Israel, the other one is, is, uh, is Egypt. So uh, obviously, you know, if the Egyptians say something, uh, try to, they, they have a clear stake in it. The, they call the shots in the situation. So, but uh, here uh, it was not clear, you know. So, um, the, so eventually I think the Gaza war was a limited Israeli success. Um, that um, was uh, um, one phase in a long struggle against radical Islam. I don't see, we, sh we should be, a, we cannot win against radical Islam in a simple war. There is no Klavuzevitian victory against Hamas. You cannot convince Hamas of giving up their political goals. Therefore, the only thing you can do is to try uh, to limit their military capabilities to harm you. This is, by the way, true also of Islamic State that you are facing. And, um, don't expect that uh, Baghdadi will become a liberal, or you can replace him with, uh, you know, uh, your own son of a bitch, uh, liberal. You know, that, that doesn't work. It, you know, you, that, 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 it's not the situation. <coughs> so again, vis-a-vis -vis, uh, uh, the Islamic State, you try to destroy as much as possible their capabilities uh, to harm you and your allies. I'm not sure that, uh, you know, how many sorties are uh, a day? Uh, six, seven? You know? I'm not sure this is a type of, uh, you know, uh, military activity that really impresses, uh, you know, the Islamic State. Uh, but uh, this is what should be done, of course, uh, in a more uh, intensive way. Uh, and it, it's a long struggle. It's a long struggle. It, it's a war of attrition. It's not, I know the Americans, as well as the Israelis, you know, they want quick victories, you know, America particularly, quick food, you know, ev everything quickly, quickly. You are, you are impatient, uh, Hector, basically. So, uh, but you, in this type of situation, you need a lot of patience. And uh, this war is going to be decided, you know, uh, 50 years, 60 years, maybe more, who knows? Uh, by the way, uh, Islamic uh, jihad is uh, 
around since the seventh uh, century. And you have the struggle, you know, Christianity, the Western world, against uh, radical Islam uh, for many years, for centuries. And this is going on. So uh, you should realize that this is part of a historic struggle over, over values, over, over many other things. I'd like to ask a question for a moment. Um, I've seen the discovery of large natural gas and oil deposits uh, off the coast of Israel and south of Cyprus and possibly elsewhere in the eastern Mediterranean uh, compared to uh, finding a, a heavy chest of gold in the middle of a buffalo stampede. Um, it, it's kind of dangerous to stop and pull it out. You might get trampled to death. Um, how important is security for the uh, for turning those assets, uh, natural gas, into uh, into profit for the countries that, that stand to gain? What are the threats, and what what needs to be done? Basically, it's a very combustible material. You know, you use uh, fire, uh, it goes. <laughs> That's a problem, you know, of defending this type of uh, installations that, uh, you know, a small uh, successful terrorist attack can create a lot of, uh, of damage. Uh, from what I know, uh, Israelis are making uh, great efforts in uh, defending uh, by a variety of means, naval, uh, aerial, you know, intelligence, of course, is very important. Uh, to defend uh, our our gas fields, uh, the Navy loves the idea. You know they can demand money now. You know it, uh, it justifies. You know, so um, it uh, the threats are clear. You know a boat with explosives comes in, gets close. So you know a missile, and they, they get more and more accurate missiles. So this type of, uh, you know, if it shoots a, a, this type of ring, it can destroy, it can do a lot of damage. It also, you know, it undermines, uh, you know, uh, the credibility of deliveries, you know, all, all this is, is associated with, with a terrorist attack. Uh, therefore, this must be uh, uh, defended. And uh, <laughs> in our region, you know, uh, you, we have here a lawyer. Lawyers are not enough to defend your property, you know. That's, uh, be aware, you know. Uh, you don't go to court with uh, Hezbollah, you know. It's mine. Uh, so what? Uh, this type, so uh, it's basically a very violent uh, neighborhood in which uh, some people clearly don't want uh, Israel to uh, benefit from it. They don't want Cyprus to benefit. The Turks basically said to Cyprus, we are your partners. It's mafia-type uh, politics. They say, you know, it's ours as well. That's, uh, you know, it's... Uh, huh? No, they say, we are also in Cyprus. It's ours. So uh, how do you deal with this type of situations? So, oh, you have to, to, to respond, uh, to be able to respond uh, militarily. That's the only way. And uh, it demands... Uh, political determination. Uh, and I'm not sure everywhere there is uh, political determination. Um, yeah. There's a question back here. <coughs> Sorry. Elliot Wolf, I'm kind of a student of well, I, I don't hear that. My name's Elliot Wolf, and I'm kind of a student of these affairs. Um, Professor Invar, you seem to have successfully avoided the issue of Iranian nuclear ambitions and whether uh, Bibi or anyone else has the power, the capability of addressing them uh, effectively. Uh, I mentioned the Shiite corridor, which is uh, the link to Iran. Uh, of course, if Iran becomes nuclear, it will have uh, greater latitude uh, to go on with its uh, uh, revisionist plans. Uh, about uh, if Israel has the capability uh, to stop uh, the Iranian nuclear bomb, I'm confident we do. 
Uh, I'm also confident that we are uh, making the preparations. Uh, I'm less confident if an uh, order will be given by uh, the political echelon. Uh, you know, uh, the Israeli army is a uh, democratic army. They don't do things on their own. And so uh, they need an order. Uh, I know there is a feeling, and we talked about it before, that uh, you know, Israel did a lot of barking. And, you know, uh, do we have the teeth, you know? Do we, um, it's difficult now, first of all, because uh, Americans are getting close to an agreement with, uh, with the Iranian. So basically, any Israeli attack on Iran will be an affront to the United States. Uh, uh, United States is our strongest ally, a very important uh, uh, strategic, economic partner. Um, uh, at the same time, in my view, you know, uh, I think uh, we should do everything uh, possible to prevent Iran from becoming a nuclear power. Um, so uh, this is uh, the vectors that work. Uh, I come from the land of the prophets, but I'm not a prophet. So I don't know what will happen. This is definitely an option for, for Israel, which is... Uh, taken seriously by, by, by the Israeli government, if I can tell you. What will they do? I don't know. Yeah. Please. Um, George from Amagri. Um I read or heard somewhere that the Islamic State is gaining a lot of their funding by selling a lot of the oil they're seizing on the black market. Who's buying this oil from them? Turkey. Okay. <laughs> it's good business for them. You know, they, uh, they buy cheap, they sell high. Why not? You know, it's business. Chris Steinitz from CNA's Center for Naval Analyses. Um, and as such, I'd like to return to your comment about uh, naval power and the need to invest in, uh, uh, in more, more naval power in the Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, specifically, what sorts of missions uh, do you see uh, the, the West should be looking to uh, if they were to invest in more, more naval power? Uh, there's a whole, a whole range, but I would, I would love to hear your thoughts on the matter. First of all, what's important is mere presence, you know, showing the flag. You know, the American flag still carries some weight. Um, you, uh, you should be able to uh, uh, deal uh, with uh, you know, missions like uh, piracy, counter-terrorist uh, uh, operations, special operations, this type of uh, you know, uh, operations. Um, don't do political engineering. Forget about it. No, don't, don't try to fix somebody in your image. It's not working. Uh, the natives don't like you. That's a fact. Uh, the, Turkey, uh, the Turkish uh, sailors that were attacked, uh, it's an expression of uh, many years of uh, anti-American feelings in the Turkish population. So, uh, in, in when you were denied uh, a northern front uh, in Iraq, uh, it expressed uh, the popular preferences. So um, uh, the Palestinians are the worst, by the way, in terms of anti-Americanism. Uh, generally, this region uh, doesn't, uh, the popular feelings, we have to distinguish between the elites. The elites send their children to American school, put their money into American banks, uh, but uh, the masses are anti-American, and anti-American is, is also a tool uh, for the dictators, uh, whatever they are, and uh, to, uh, to mobilize support for them. Uh, so don't do political engineering, <coughs> but you have to be able to identify the bad guys and, uh, and go after them. Well, this is uh, very effective. You yeah, well, if I could just add to that, um, an aircraft carrier uh, in the Eastern Med would allow the United States to project air power throughout the region. It would allow for the 
establishment of no-fly zones where necessary, the Marine Amphibious Ready Group um, would make it uh, possible for uh, Americans to be evacuated as necessary in the area so we don't have to rely on Greek ferries to get Americans out of Libya, for example. Um, the escort ships of a carrier battle group um, would be very useful in protecting sovereignty claims should they be challenged um, in Cyprus and in Israeli water exclusive economic zones. So there's a, a, a whole host of missions that are waiting to be done there. The presence of both the carrier and a marine amphibious ready group would go a long way towards signaling our intention to remain engaged to the Russians. That would help with our Egyptian problem. Um, so if just a, a marine amphibious ready group and an aircraft carrier battle group were, uh, were put in the Eastern Med, it would have a tremendously beneficial effect for American arms, American diplomacy in the area. Sure, sure. I just want to add that one thing that, you know, military power is not enough without the political determination to use it. So uh, you can build hundreds of carriers if uh, the bad guy thinks that they are not going to be used Forget it. Seth, just to, to, to follow up on, on your comment there, um, w what sort of, of presence uh, for, for a carrier would, would you like to see? Uh, obviously, there are carriers that transit uh, a whole lot, but you seem to be advocating a, a more permanent, uh, regularized uh, presence, uh, just to, to expand on your thought. Thanks. I, I like your word permanent. <laughs> yeah, I think that's right. One, one would be fine. We can start off with one. We had two in the Cold War, and we're facing a more formidable adversary than, uh, than Turkey and uh, Hezbollah and Hamas. Uh, but uh, I wouldn't rule out two. I mean, I wouldn't rule out anything. Thank you for your question. I see a hand in the back here. There. Hi, I'm Gary Sargent. I run a small um, consulting firm. I'm a retired Army officer, Special Forces guy. I spent a couple of years as a security assistance chief in Beirut. And one of the natural... You survived. Yep. And one of the natural allies, in my mind, to Israel's sort of predicaments in the Middle East would be Lebanon in some form or fashion. Um, it's a buffer to some extent. And I think it's, a, in my opinion, having lived there for a few years, it's a semi-functioning democracy, unlike most of the rest of the Islamic-based states in the region. You tell me. I, I sort of want to hear your comments and thoughts. Well, I think uh, basically uh, Lebanon is a failed state uh, because a failed state uh, because uh, it has no monopoly of use of force is the main essence of a political entity, a Weberian uh, definition of, of a modern entity, uh, because uh, Hezbollah is there. And, uh, um, now, uh, <laughs> you see, in 82, we tried to arrange to fix Lebanon. Uh, I think we learned our lesson. Uh, the, hmm? So uh, uh, it's, uh, I don't think that uh, Lebanese are trustworthy. Uh, of course, if they are common interests, we can do business together, but to see them as a natural ally, uh, not even the Christians, come on. Uh, they are, uh, in Lebanon, they are, uh, they are very Middle Eastern, those guys. So, uh, um, and Lebanon is now power, you know, what, 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 what do, how many divisions does the, do the Lebanese have? You know, they, they have nothing. Uh, and in, 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 in southern Lebanon, which is close to Israel, they are the Shiites, uh, they are the dominant force, who is Hezbollah there. So, um, uh, unless uh, the Christian will go uh, for a petit Liban, you know, that's what was offered to them, small, in French, small Leb Leban. But they were got greedy, they wanted Grand Liban, so they got all the Arabs, the Muslims, you know, the, to build a state which is uh, totally 
dysfunctional in my view. For a while they succeeded to, to be together, but uh, Islamic uh, radicalism took over. And Hezbollah is calling the shots in, uh, in Lebanon. And uh, Lebanon as it is today, uh, I don't think is able to be a, a real partner of, uh, of Israel. Jackie Folga, Middle East Institute. Um, Erdogan has been a very vocal critic of Israel, especially during the recent incursion. Will you slow down? Sorry. Slow down. Erdogan has been a very... I've shot too much during my <laughs> military career. I don't hear Has it. been a very vocal critic of Israel, especially during the recent incursion in Gaza. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering that this has definitely hindered the trilateral relationship between the United States, Turkey, and Israel. What will it take to re-engage and re-establish a relationship between Israel and Turkey? I think as long as Erdogan is there, there's uh, no chance of, uh, of any uh, improving, improvement of relations, improvement in relations. Uh, and the issue is, of course, much larger. There is a struggle over the soul of Turkey, in Turkey. Whether Turkey is going Islamist or uh, the secularists uh, are able to maintain a a different identity for, for Turkey. And um, for a while, I must say, I was uh, supportive of the AKP, believing that uh, there is uh, a good idea to have a synthesis between modernity and tradition, uh, because uh, Ataturk went too far, in my view, in, in his secularization efforts. Uh, but I was wrong. And uh, AKP is Islamist, it go, will go all the way, uh, and the secularists are uh, very weak. Uh, some of my colleagues at the universities are sending their children outside of the country to stay there. When an elite is, is losing its appetite to stay and fight for its ideals, it's bad news. Um, I, uh, after the Gezi Park, uh, events, I went to Turkey to see, m I, I spent a lot of time on Turkey, I've written on Turkey, and I, I wanted to see with my own eyes whether there was uh, any secularist leader emerging out of the Gezi Park uh, events, and, and it was quite clear to me that uh, the secularists uh, don't have anybody that can be as adept or as Erdogan in politics, in Turkish politics, and he's a great politician. Incredible. He is, uh, uh, he is successful in mobilizing uh, almost half of the population uh, to his side, which is tremendous political achievement. Uh, and um, the secularists in Turkey are remind me of uh, you know Israel Mapai party. They are old. They lost the touch with the people, and uh, they are losing the battle over the heart of of, of Turkey. Unfortunately. I, I like Turkey. I think it's, uh, I like the Turks. I, I like Turkish coffee. And it's, uh, uh, it's a great country, but it's going the wrong direction. Thank you for letting me have a, a second question. It's something I wanted to ask if I ever found myself in the room with an Eastern Mediterranean expert. Uh, thank you very much for your comments today. The, uh, I, I'm the son of an oil man from the oil states, and, and I know that when you find oil and gas reserves in an area, you often find that it's the tip of the iceberg, and, and there could be, could be more there. I hope so. Yes. Um, uh, it was uh, Mr. Cropsey's remark about the oil chest in the, s in the uh, Buffalo stampede that uh, triggered this question made me think more globally. China is involved in, in a war of hearts and minds in Africa, uh, the South Pacific, I everywhere, in, they are everywhere in the world uh, uh, hoping that somebody will strike oil or find gold. And uh, historically they don't have that much relationship with the Eastern Mediterranean or that region 
maybe since Marco Polo, but, but my question is, uh, are they in the future? It's such a, uh, an active equation going on there. Is, is China somehow involved in the future of this region? Well, I, uh, my center gets inundated by Chinese uh, delegations. Actually, I have a clear uh, litmus uh, test, you know. If they need a translator, I don't talk to them. Um, the Chinese are very active, particularly in Israel, because of technology, because as they see us, uh, you know, as an important actor in Washington. Um, so uh, they are in, uh, they try even in Israel, you know, infrastructure projects. Um, but in my view, uh, China is not going to be to fall on, on Israel's side or on the West side. So I'm not sure I'm welcoming, you know, a, a greater Chinese role in, in, in this region. Uh, they are basically, you know, pro-Iranian. They had a good deal, energy deal with the Russians after the Crimean uh, crisis. So um, China is an important market for Israel, of course. But uh, politically, we have to be careful. I think also the Americans make sure that uh, there are certain things which we don't sell to them, and uh, we have to listen to Uncle Sam, you know, on those issues. Uh, China is there. They want... Uh, there is a big debate about China, you know. I have Indian friends, Far East. I, I find it difficult to believe that they are just in for the money ability and all this it's but uh, the future will tell you know if uh, they they want more there's a question in the back there and then we'll move here to the front row thank you uh, good morning my name is simon Faraco. i'm a retired career diplomat from venezuela and for some times uh, for some years we have heard news about the alliance between the Venezuelan, the current Venezuelan regime and the Iranian government. And there has been some news about uh, the Venezuelan regime providing raw material to the nuclear program in Iran on secret flights. Also, some uh, financial stronghold of some uh, um, personnel from the regime to Hamas and Hezbollah. Do you care to comment about it? Do you, do you have any knowledge about it? I think it's a well-known uh, fact that uh, Venezuela um, is uh, cooperating with in Iran on many issues. It allows uh, Hamas presence in uh, Latin America. Um, I wouldn't be surprised uh, to see the barren drugs in, uh, in Mexico being connected to Hamas. Uh, to Hezbollah. Uh, this is uh, the backyard of the United States, and uh, you know, uh, we leave it to the Americans to take care of it. Uh, but Venezuela is, uh, is bad news. Uh, I hope you are retired here, not there, yes? Uh, yeah, here, yeah. living here. Uh, good, good luck. <laughs> Stan Sienkiewicz, uh, presently at USAID. Uh, your <laughs> prognosis analysis on Turkey, as, as gloomy as it was, was nonetheless very insightful. I wonder if you'd offer a similar dissection of the prospects for, I think, even more urgently, Egypt. Uh, I think that uh, there are two major powers, political powers in, uh, in Egypt. One is the military, and one is the Muslim Brotherhood. In free elections, the Muslim Brotherhood had the upper hand. Uh, so one lesson is not to push democracy in Egypt. Uh, Assisi uh, represents uh, the military. Uh, the military has uh, economic uh, empire. 
has its own ambitions. It has its own vision of what Egypt should be. And Egypt is the only real country, real state in the Middle East, in the Arab world. All the rest are uh, you know, entities there with no identity. Egypt is misery, something serious. And uh, the military has been traditionally involved in politics. And they will not easily give up on, uh, on power. And uh, they have no uh, moral inhibitions and no Supreme Court of Justice to stop them from uh, you know, uh, butchering uh, the, Mukh the Muslim Brotherhood. Um, I, uh, I hope they'll be successful. And uh, because the alternative is worse. I don't think Egypt will evolve anytime soon into a democracy. So if those are the two choices, my choice is clear. Uh, an important factor uh, in the military uh, uh, you know, important position is that they have guns. And uh, you can do wonders with guns you know, in, in a political system. The, what we see uh, is that uh, there are actors like uh, Iran that are providing guns to the Muslim Brotherhood in order to destabilize the region. Uh, Israel has been very flexible. For example, on the clauses of the militarization of Sinai, allowing uh, greater infusions of forces, Egyptian forces into Sinai to try to deal with, uh, with the radical uh, Muslims in, in Sinai. Uh, they have a problem not only in Sinai, they have a problem in the Delta. Uh, and uh, we may see maybe a civil war, so, but uh, so far the military was able to contain uh, the Muslim Brotherhood uh, to a great degree in Egypt, less so in Sinai. <coughs> uh, but they are working on it. And uh, for example, they see Hamas as a mortal enemy. They are doing things to Hamas, which, uh, you know, if we would have done it, the whole world would be against us. But Egypt, you know, it's different. Uh, I think we have time for one more question. In the back, sir. Good afternoon. I'm Scott Morgan. I'm the president of Red Eagle Enterprises. I have a quick two-part question. One. What about the increased interest of both Saudi Arabia and the UAE in the Eastern Med? Because we've both seen them support Egypt military, militarily in conducting operations in Libya. And second, what about the Christian minorities in the region as well? You don't hear people talking about what's happened with the Yazidis in northern Iraq or the cops in Egypt. Uh, very few people are willing to address that. I was wondering what your take, or take is on them. Well, the Christians are a, a dying species in the Middle East. Those that are still alive are trying to emigrate. We, have, we see for years, you know, the Christians of Lebanon emigrating. We see growing number of Copts uh, from Egypt. And the Copts are the original, you know, Egyptian population. They are leaving uh, because uh, of the pressure of the Islamic. Um, so, uh, it, of course, Islamic... Uh, state is uh, totally intolerant of those type of uh, minorities. Uh, about um, the help of the Gulf states to, to Egypt, yes, they see Egypt as an important country. That, uh, they don't want uh, Egypt to fall under uh, Muslim rule, and they help it. Egypt, uh, Egypt's number one priority is uh, to get food for its people. Egypt is uh, a big problem. Jordan is a small problem. A few billions, you can solve the problem. Egypt is very different. It's 80 million people. Uh, so um, <laughs> Egypt has a uh, <laughs> I don't want to give them ideas, but you know, uh, if they want to improve their economic situation, they can take Libya. And, you know, they're already a bit active there. If they take Libya, they'll have uh, more money. I, I'm not sure it will solve all their problems. Uh, I'm not sure I want them to take Libya because uh, then it, Egypt will be a much stronger actor. 
but uh, uh, I think that uh, <coughs> the chaos in Libya may invite more and more Egyptian uh, interference. Um, and um, uh, they'll start thinking also about economic benefits of being involved in, in part of Libya, you know, the, the eastern part of Libya. Anyway, uh, Le uh, Libya is also uh, very divided between east and west, uh, the tribal situation. So um, <coughs> Egypt uh, will have to find a way to, to feed their people. Uh, for the time being, the Saudi solution is not a bad one. Uh, I'm also ready to take Saudi money. No, why not? So uh, <coughs> they are taking uh, for years. That's not new. The, uh, this type of uh, uh, money uh, transfers uh, are not, an old thing. The Egyptians got used to it. It's easier than to make uh, to adopt the right economic policies because then it will destroy the military economic empire. So uh, as long as they uh, can live, uh, it's like a welfare state, you know. They, they get the money from the Saudi. Well, if I am a professor in Bar, um, I'd like to thank you very much for <laughs> speaking here at Hudson this morning. I cannot help but notice that behind many of your, and in front, of uh, many of your observations, and as well as the questions that have come from the floor, um, is the issue of <coughs> where the United States is and what the United States engagement is and the d disappearance of American involvement in the region. Uh, the only point I would add to that is that uh, it would, I think it would be a mistake to assume that this will continue indefinitely into the future and I think things will change, no matter what happens in, in 2016. So uh, on that attempt to be optimistic, um, let me uh, thank you again uh, and the audience for your careful listening and good questions. And uh, I think um, we've spoken, so now we can eat. And uh, there's, there's food outside, so uh, please join us. Thank you again. Thank you. <laughs>